All right, good morning, everybody. And I am Barb Nango, Community Manager at Known. Welcome to Known Live. And I'm really excited this morning to be talking with uh, Megan Wooding. She is the author of the book, Dear Sister. And are you from New Haven proper, Megan? Or so I'm actually from Wallingford. From Wallingford. Um, and the original inhabitants of Wallingford are actually the Quinnipiac. So we're in oh, Quinnipiac thank you for telling us. Yeah, thank you for telling us. I've been touting you as a New Haven author. and it That's just fine. Occurs, I take it. <laughs> it just occurred to me this morning. You're a local author. Yes. So New Haven, New Haven County. New Haven County. Okay, so we're going to be hearing from Megan this morning, and she's going to talk about why she wrote the book, Dear Sister, the process of writing the book, and also self-publishing and why she chose that. And uh, we're inviting anybody who wants to make any comments to go ahead and do so on Facebook Live. Whether you're watching this live or you're watching a recording, you can go ahead and, and put in some comments, and we'll respond to them at some point. And I'll be putting... Megan's contact information and her social media information up. But before we go into that, I do want to invite you to attend some of the upcoming events on Known Live. Next Tuesday, we have Digital Media Sync, which is with the social media maven, Julia Gooch. She is from Agents of Branding, and it will be uh, her broadcast number four of four on Google Analytics. And next week, she will be talking about Google Analytics for everybody that has e-commerce. And then next Thursday, which is the 28th, will be our third edition of Pivot Talk. This is a series where we have some of our experts talking with businesses and entrepreneurs who have pivoted, which is something that many businesses have to do at some point in time, uh, successful businesses anyway, but right now many of us are pivoting because of the COVID-19 environment. And we'll be talking with Della Leapman. She is the creator of Nestle, which is a lactation space that can actually be portable. And she's gonna be talking about how she is pivoting to accommodate the COVID-19 environment where we are going to be so much more health conscious in our workspaces. I also want to invite anyone who is interested in being on Known Live to uh, either drop a comment in or to contact me. And I'm going to put my contact information up here um, as soon as I can find it. And I'll put it, I'll, I'll show it, and then um, I will put it back up again. And I also want to invite all of you to go to knowncoworking.com. If you're interested in watching any of our shows again, they're all on that website. And at this point, I am now going to turn it over to Megan. So would love to hear uh, everything that you want to share with us about your sister. Take it away, Megan. Thank you so much. I, um, I'm so grateful and honored that um, we can do this today. And thank you for inviting me here. So my book, Dear Sister, launched in January of this year. And like Barb said, I'm here to write, to talk a little bit about why I wrote it and um, answer some common questions that I've gotten. Yes, I have, I have one here too. Ah. <laughs> Um, cause there, there's always some common questions that always come up, you know, when you tell people you wrote a book. So I'll share a little bit about those. Um, I wrote in a blog post recently that as soon as I started writing Dear Sister, actually, I learned that everybody else in my life also had the aspiration of writing a book. Sorry. And where'd I go? I, I was trying to make it so that you were <laughs> at the front and center and that didn't work. That's okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I learned that pretty much everybody else in my life also either had the aspiration of writing a book or was planning on writing a book. Um, and at first, you know, that was a little bit like, okay, well, you know, that's my cool thing. But what I really, really came to treasure about those conversations is that when folks tell me that they 
are writing a book or want to write a book, they're telling me that they have something that they're really deeply passionate about that they want to share with the world. And as someone who's always disliked small talk, I can tell you that um, having written a book is the fast pass to the conversational deep end, which is my favorite place to be. So um, one of the questions that I always get is, what's your book about? And it's still one of the hardest questions for me to answer because it's about a lot of things. Um, it's about personal reclamation and building deep supportive communities. It's an examination of how harmful religious systems can be when they're used as a tool of control instead of liberation. Um, and it's about starting conversations and asking questions and learning to hold compassionate space for ourselves and others. So one of my readers said that it's part workbook, part memoir, and part affirmation deck. And I really liked that. <laughs> I don't know, Barb, I know that you've read a little bit. So yeah. I don't know if you can confirm that or not. Yeah, I, I absolutely can. I can tell you, I, I was telling Megan this morning, I've only gotten through about a third of it, and I'm really excited to read more of it. And one of the, the most exciting things to me was when I flipped the page to the new chapter, and it started with another letter that began Dear Sister, and it was from Megan, and it was very touching um, to have this. And, and in fact, the name of the chapter was Releasing Shame, which is a, a journey that I have taken, and um, hopefully we'll have an opportunity to talk about that. But I love that there's this, I felt personally connected to you from that. Aw, I'm so, I'm so glad. I uh, Originally, I had, because the, the book is also not officially split up, but it, there's like a couple sections. There's like the first s s grouping of chapters is really about um, like personal inquiry and evaluation. And then the later chapters are more about community, um, like, like turning that lens outwards. Mm -hmm. So originally I had like two or three, I wanna say um, letters and my editor actually was like, you should put a letter in the front of every chapter. I'm like, okay, I can do that. <laughs> and it worked out being a, to be a very, I feel like it was a really good way to kind of link everything together mm -hmm. personally. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so Dear Sister is a letter of affirmation and inquiry. Um, inviting women especially to claim the most potent versions of themselves and share their gifts. Um, so it shares my story, but I also interviewed five other women uh, for the book because I didn't just want it to be the Megan show. Um, <laughs> uh, I have my own personal experiences, obviously, but I wanted to, to center other women as well who had experiences that I didn't speak to as personally. So um, we're talking about the stories that are can be very sticky, that really are the things that become defining factors in our personal lives, whether or not they're something that we really share uh, in a public way, right? So things like coping with mental illness, abuse, eating disorders, and other trauma. Um, and we also talked about stories of how how those things have shaped us and shape what is what we believe is available to us um, as women, especially, and also stories of how colonial Christianity has shaped us and what we believe is available to us as women. Um, so I actually share the story of what inspired me to write the book in the introduction. I didn't know if you would be okay with me reading a little bit of that. I think that'd be absolutely yeah. great. Okay. Yeah. All right. So. Nothing like hearing an author read their own words. I get to listen <laughs> you know, to someday I might do an audiobook of it. I haven't. I think that's a great idea. I I really love listening to audiobooks, but I really love it when it's the author because you know all of the vocal inflections are yes. exactly what they intended. Yeah, me too. And now when I, I pull up an audiobook to read and it's not the, I'm like, hmm. Yeah. <laughs> not the same. Right. So in January of 2018, I had the privilege of attending a workshop led by one of my favorite authors, Erin Brown. At the end, she had all of us stand in two circles and repeat affirmations to each other. First, the outer circle to the inner circle, and then vice versa. After each affirmation, the circle shifted and we met new partners. I came face to face with woman after woman, repeating back and forth with her words of encouragement and apology. Many of these women I had never met, 
yet their faces mirrored the very things I felt in my deepest soul about being seen and valued, about my needs and my wounds. Every affirmation started with the words, dear sister, and they were the words echoing in my heart as I left. After the sister circle, Erin quipped that if this is what church felt like, she would be there all the time. <laughs> I knew one thing for sure. I felt more profound love, grace, genuine confession and repentance that night than I have in most church services I've attended through many years of organized religion. My takeaway was a little different though. I thought back to all the women I have met and talked to in the church, struggling to meet God through a haze of religious expectations and practices passed down for millennia. What words did I have for them? What solace? What sisterhood? And so Dear Sister was born, a letter to my sisters, an invitation to community and healing, an exploration of a God who made every one of us exactly as God meant to and does not punish us for our humanity, our limits, or our needs. An examination of how we've allowed our culture of hustling and consumerism to contaminate our most sacred spaces. A rally cry to build safe and brave community together. Thank you for joining with me. Mm, love it. Love it. So I wrote Dear Sister for a lot of reasons. Um, but one of the biggest reasons was that I have come to believe very deeply that empowered women transform communities. Um, so I read a lot of books as I was writing Dear Sister, but one of the most um, impactful, I would say, books was Half the Sky by Nicholas Kristoff and Cheryl Wudon. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that at all. So Half the Sky tackles um, really all the very hard things socially about being born female in our world and including in the global south. So that is, you know, everything from um, gender side, lack of education and medical care available to women and girls, um, like really, really hard and messy, sticky things and, and hard things to change because they're ingrained yeah, um, systemic, and yeah. it's systemic. So it's not an easy, there's no easy fix for these things, right? Mm -hmm. So, but through all that, one of my biggest takeaways from that book was that um, one of the best ways that they have found to improve community life in Global South and these communities that are really struggling with poverty and very, very challenging um, situations is to empower the women in the community. And they find that when they empower women in the community through even like, you know, micro loans, through, um, you know, small and like teaching them like small investment um, groups and entrepreneurship, that the women reinvest what they create into their community, into their families, into sending their kids to school um, and into the betterment of their community. Whereas the men in the community, not always so much. Mm -hmm. So um, this, this was just a really great example that empowering women, you know, really does transform communities and if it's if it's on that scale in those places it's on such a different scale and in a different um, realm in the situations and the cultures that we're talking about now mm -hmm. so um, I wrote Dear Sister because I traced disconnects and fractures in my life and community and I realized that a lot of folks couldn't easily access resources that I had really sought out um, so Dear Sister is both affirmation for people already on this journey home to their truest selves, but also a map of some guideposts that I have found mm -hmm. for people who are just starting out. So I purposely wrote it in a way that would hopefully be accessible for someone who maybe never had an understanding of what the word patriarchy meant, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> um, because I know, like, I know people who are, who just think that, you know, oh, it's just, a, it's just a buzzword or just a catchphrase, mm -hmm. right? You know, they don't have an understanding of what's being discussed when we start talking about those topics. Mm -hmm. So I I wrote Dear Sister for that. Um, I wrote Dear Sister because there was no guide for my personal reclamation journey. Um, I read a lot of really deep and moving and treasured books, but none of them clearly connected how religious organizations fall prey to the same ills that all of society does and really how those present in our lives. 
-hmm. None of them told me how to find my people, what internal work I might need to do so that I could even enter relationships with people that I wanted to in like honestly and authentically. Mm -hmm. um, and I wrote Dear Sister to honor my past self, you know. Um, oh, here's my other favorite, my other favorite reason that I wrote Dear Sister. I wrote Dear Sister because I very much believe, as much as I believe that empowering women transforms communities, I believe that we all need all our gifts. So um, in her TED talk, My Identity is a Superpower, America Ferrara shared how challenging it was for her to find roles of substance when she first started acting. And she had this dream of being an actress and all they wanted, all people, producers wanted to give her was um, really stereotypical roles that um, they wanted her to, you know, put on an accent for. It was very minimizing to both what she could do and um, and her heritage. And I'm not sure, you guys may or may not be aware, she ended up landing this role, um, the lead role in a TV show called Ugly Betty, uh, which is a comedy, but it has a lot of sweetness. It has a lot of depth to it in places. And it was a big break for her. So the entire TED Talk is worth a, worth a listen. But what impressed me most about this is that America shared how Malala decided that she wanted to be a journalist because she found DVDs of Ugly Betty and watched them. So now let's think about what might have happened if America Ferrara um, didn't push through that. Like if she had accepted defeat, if she had looked at all the roles where she was expected to minimize who she was, to hide who she was and just said, this isn't for me. Um, if she had not developed her gift and pushed through that, would we have, would we know who Malala is today? Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's possible that she would have found other inspiration, but it's also possible that we would have missed out on her impact. Mm -hmm. So this is why we all need all our gifts. And it may not feel like that thing that makes you come alive has any great impact to you, but our job isn't to measure our impact. Our job is to offer what we have to share, right? So what you have to share could inspire the next Malala, you, you should say. Wonderful. <laughs> um, can I ask you some questions about these? Why? Okay, so I'm interested in um, what, for you personally, you, you said this is a journey of reclamation. Mm -hmm. What were you reclaiming? Um, I'm also interested in hearing, you know, you're saying empowering women empowers community. So how has your journey of empowerment impacted your community? And then what are all these gifts of yours that you um, I write. Like? <laughs> okay. Fantastic. I write. Um, and also I've really I've really come to start kind of nurturing community around these topics and around the book. And it gives um women especially um a place to share and hopefully to feel like it's okay for them to be fully themselves and it's okay for them to grow and it's okay for them to ask questions and that they will have community no matter what kind of questions they're asking i feel like a lot of our social communities are very based in specific identifiers mm -hmm. so like you know faith is a huge identifier and a lot of women find that if they start questioning things about how they have been and it's not even just like faith in general it's like this very it's like very specific um like do not sometimes like it's a denominational uh set of rules and regulations so if you start questioning that then um a lot of times your relationships in those communities is dependent on it and it's really sad and kind of wrong but <laughs> it's hard so I think to create community where um, you're accepted for who you are uh, and I know that sounds probably kind of trite but Except I think it's really profound and deep yeah right because you so actually can do it us, yeah so many of us are really afraid to share who we really are. Um, just briefly, I, I was saying to Megan before the show, um, I am in a couple of 12-step recovery programs, which I can't name publicly, 
on this broadcast, but one of them, the number one promise of that program is that we will discover our real identities. And that has been very much my journey of recovery. And so that's one of the reasons why this book resonates so deeply with me, because you're talking about things. My life experience is incredibly different than mm -hmm. yours. I didn't grow up I, you know, in a religious household at all, but I have some of the same wounds and my journey to heal them has been much the same as yours. And so it's just really resonated with me. And that's something that I, I think I, um, I found because I like, I had these kind of like two vastly different experiences as far as like my experience in faith communities and my experience outside of faith communities. But in this, I, but women are saying the same things like, <laughs> We have the same stories, we have the same struggles, and we are dealing with the same social ills. Mm -hmm. Really, we are. Yeah. And you had other questions for me that I already forgot. Yeah. So you <laughs> talked about like what is it that you're reclaiming? Um maybe you might even say claiming because maybe yeah. it's not reclaiming. It's true. So some of it is, so when I talk about actual, like if we're talking about reclaiming and reclamation versus claiming, I feel like reclaiming actually for me, and this may not be true for everybody, but for me, that really speaks to like inner child work um, and self-parenting. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by that for people who aren't in like, you know, maybe that's the first time you heard about inner child work or self-parenting. Um, self-parenting is this concept that now that a lot of us have um, kind of roadblocks or coping mechanisms that we developed when we were kids due to trauma that are just not helpful in this stage of our lives now. So it's not a judgment on, you know, whatever coping mechanism we learned when we were kids, but we look at it now that we're in an adult space and we're like, okay, well, this Really isn't how I want to be responding in the situation at this point in my life. And I can, I can kind of reprogram that to some degree. So self-parenting is just going back um, now that you're an adult and giving yourself what you really need and what you needed in that space as a child to feel whole and safe. And um, that can look like all kinds of different things. Yeah. So that's actually part of what happens in one of my programs. And I think of reparenting as a, a pretty wide continuum and it can be yes. as basic as I treat myself well, mm -hmm. take care of myself. Setting a bedtime. And, and a lot of it has to do with the inner talk because many of us have this audio tape of just horrendous you mm -hmm. know, stuff going on in our heads and switching that around. And it can be as profound as really cultivating an, an image inside your head of who might a loving parent be for you. So some people might pick a character from a movie or a book or a TV or mm -hmm. something. Some people it's themselves. And then sort of invoking that persona and having them talk to you, nurture you, affirm you, maybe even set boundaries with you mm -hmm. in a way that a healthy parent would do um, in the moments when you really need it. And so it's, it, you know, it's really wide spectrum of things yes. that you can do in terms of that. And some of it's really basic and some of it's pretty deep and profound. Yes. Yes. And I don't know, I feel like there's a few checks that you, you find, like, like, I don't know, I feel like the longer you do this, you'll, you'll come across something in your life and you'll feel like, You'll, you'll have a moment where you feel like incredibly defensive or um, disembodied or, you know, something happens and you're like, oh, that's that's a thing. That's that's a thing that I need to come back to and do some work on. You know, I think that the longer you do it, the more you recognize those spaces where it can be helpful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So the other question was you talked about that your experience is empowering women empowers communities. So how has your personal journey of empowerment empowered your community? You've, you've said a little bit of it, but I'd yeah, like so I, I think building, um, building community, especially in the online space has been one way. Um, I've also hosted not really to, kind of related to the book, but not um, specifically to do with the book. I'm also a photographer and I've hosted a couple of um, photo workshops where women can come together as a group and really heal their relationship with um, their image of themselves in photos. And we work through a lot of the kind of disembodiment that comes with, um, with 
seeing ourselves in photos and having that be all over the internet and um, how we feel about our image and really kind of claiming who we really are and how we really look and having that be okay. Yeah. And um, I got some also, also I love the photos. So, um, so that's one way. And one of my favorite things about doing that isn't just like, it isn't just the photos. The photos are great. You know, getting people together is great, but I can tell you that all of the times that I have done it, all of the women that came together that didn't know each other before the workshop all still talk. Mm, that's fantastic. And you know, that's the right. This moment is very powerful because everybody's looking at themselves on video on zoom. And I mean, yeah. I, it, because my 12 step recovery meetings are all uh -huh. on zoom and a lot of people have really serious problems with their self image. And some people are, it's messing with their heads, mm -hmm. to be looking, especially because you're comparing yourself to other people, right? You know, you're looking at your picture in the context of other people. And for some people, it's so painful. So that, mm -hmm. you know, reclaiming this is, this is who I am. Yeah. So yeah. important. It and really also is. there's something really, really um, particularly healing about doing it in a group of women because mm -hmm. you feel completely different seeing another woman get her photo taken than you do getting your photo taken. Mm -hmm. And also when you're experiencing that vulnerability and community, mm -hmm. uh, it's, there's just, there's a lot of affirmation. It's very nurturing space mm -hmm. and it feels like a safe space to confront those really hard feelings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think um, when we see, for example, if a lot of us have these ideas of what's going on inside of other people's heads, what we, in recovery, we say we compare our insides to other people's outsides. Yes. So you might see a woman who mm -hmm. you think as a really beautiful woman and think she's got it made. She's got no problems. And then when you hear her talking about, Oh my God, I, I, you know, I nitpick about this and that yes. it's, you know, it's really astonishing. I had a friend years and years ago who was this incredibly beautiful woman, really smart, super talented singer, actor, all this stuff. And I used to be like, Oh my God, she's amazing. And when we got to know each other, she told me how she was so focused on the fact that she had eczema. Mind you, I didn't know. And she did wear mm -hmm. like short sleeves and stuff. And she was so focused on what other people thought about her skin. And I was like, wow, like mm -hmm. everybody has their demons because yeah. here I am holding her on this pedestal. And I like, I'm like, nobody notices your skin. Just so yeah, you know. Yeah. You're like, that's not what people. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's just not a thing. And it was a real, it was a huge moment in my life, honestly, yeah. to realize, you know, I have these ideas of what other people's lives are like, and I'm uh -huh. like, you know. Yeah. Wonderful. So actually, I have a workshop, COVID permitting, I have a workshop pending in June or July. Mm -hmm. um, of doing this again with and actually partnering with a local shop in Clinton. Um, Cheryl from Spoiled is going to host. Okay. So if, if all of that works out, <laughs> if you, if you connect with me after this, you'll, um, you'll see that when, when we get the details ironed out. That, I'll put the banner back on the bottom there. So Megan yeah. says she's most active on Instagram, which yeah. is her handle there is M Wooding. Mm -hmm. And that actually just feeds right on to her Facebook account, which is Megan E. Wooding on Facebook. And then we also have her website here if you're interested in connecting with her directly. And um, in case you are watching this on the recording, you can also leave comments after this has been posted. And anybody who wants to either ask a question of Megan now or um, provide a comment, you can go ahead and do so. And I will feed those comments to Megan. Um, but do you, is there more that you want to say about the writing of the book? Um, I think that's pretty much pretty much all I had. And then I had some notes on self publishing too. Okay, so maybe before we go into the self publishing, I um, have a whole bunch of stuff that you know, some of it I, I just want to read. Just yeah, here. Um, because it really resonated with me. And then some of it I'd like to ask you about because we did you know, we're only about halfway through we have about a half an hour. So I think okay, we have plenty perfect. To talk about self publishing. So the first quote, um, has to do with perfectionism. And Megan says, I thought if I had higher standards for myself than anyone else could have for me, I would be able to avoid their disappointment 
and rejection. And I think that that is a perfect um, definition of perfectionism. And I know that I've never thought of myself as a perfectionist, but I absolutely have had extremely high standards for myself, which means, of course, I have very high standards for other people. And my journey of recovery has really helped me to see that mm -hmm. and to let go of that. And it's I think hard. I could be quoting her on that and putting it on my Instagram account, which, by the way, um, my business is Higher Power Coaching and Consulting. Yeah. My handle is at Higher Power Consulting excuse me, higher power coaching on Instagram. Yeah. So if you have Facebook, I'm not really that active. And then the other thing I want to talk about is this notion of good and right, which you <laughs> have put up the phrase G and R status. I was like, whoa, look at you, G and R status. And you say G and R is the lure of fundamentalism, really in any faith, not just Christianity. Fundamentalism is a dangerous solution combining beliefs of unworthiness, perfectionism, and shame. And like reading that, I could literally just felt like a, like a, the, the sucking of energy out of my body as I read those words. And right below that, Megan writes, I am exhausted just from writing that. <laughs> and I think that this is true about fundamentalism of any kind, whether it has to do with any, uh, whether it has to do with religion, politics if you have fundamental beliefs about anything there's this idea of you know you're either with us or you're against us kind of thing mm -hmm. so the unworthiness perfectionism and shame and this just really really struck me i double underlined it started and put exclamation point next to all that and i love how you said i am exhausted just from writing that sentence so i don't know if you want to say anything um about that notion yeah. So, so I feel like one of the biggest thing, like this whole concept of our need to be good and right is one of the things that really holds us back um, from both self-compassion and others' compassion, like, like inner and outer compassion. Um, and also being able to really like make positive change in the world because first we have to if we're if we're very invested in our own goodness and our own rightness um we then have to kind of get through that before we can make any kind of a change so mm -hmm. yeah. so we first have to you know come to terms with this fact that you know if we're wrong about something does that does that mean we're bad um right. and and we talk about this i actually learned this from um rachel ricketts who is a uh, racial justice advocate and she did a couple of uh webinars that were excellent and she talked about how this need to be good and right is something that is a real roadblock for those of us who are working in racial justice spaces. Because if we are not open to learning, to being, to learning how to be, how to do things in a better, more holistic way, then we're not going to get very far. Right. Yeah. You know, it's funny that you <clears throat> brought up that context. I have two thoughts. One is that you know, it, it's been my um, understanding and experience that the greatest roadblock to anti-racism work is well-intentioned white people. Mm -hmm. Because they're afraid to be seen as not good and they're afraid to be wrong. And that reminds mm -hmm. me of like 25 years ago, I went to an anti-racism workshop and it was a panel of people and talk about my own stereotypes getting ignited. One of the women on the panel was this obese, white woman who had a very thick southern accent and she was missing teeth so i was like like what is she going to teach me and she said something that changed my life and she said it used to be the worst thing someone could say to me is you're a racist and i realized that if someone is calling me racist they have a reason and so instead of defending against that i need to say tell me what i've done or said that has caused you to believe that I'm racist because I need to hear that. And I was like, damn, that's yeah. me. So number one, she just challenged all my stereotypes about obese Southern white woman with missing teeth. Mm -hmm. So shame on me. <clears throat> and I don't really mean shame for real. Um, but we secondly, I was like, oh my God, that's me. And so then I started realizing, and, and that's probably the one, like if somebody called me racist, I'd be like, oh my God. And 
you know, my anti-racism work has helped me to understand, like, it's impossible to grow up in a racist society and not internalize some of that. What I mm -hmm. know now is like, just because I think it doesn't mean it's true. Mm -hmm. And I challenge those beliefs. Mm -hmm. so I think that if I'm worried about being good and being right, then that's going to block me from doing that. And I will say that a large part of my uh, journey of recovery has been that, uh, you know, um, I don't care so much what other people think about me. I care what right. I think of me. It doesn't mean I don't care at all. It means that I care way more what I think of me. And so that has enabled me to set boundaries in a way that I never could before, which mm -hmm. is the wonderful benefit. And then the idea that I can say, I don't know, or oops, I was wrong. And yeah. here's something that I got in recovery from the very beginning. And most people love it when I share this notion with them. And that is, you are flossom. So just because you're flawed doesn't mean you're not awesome. And just because you're awesome doesn't mean you're not flawed. They're not mutually exclusive. So right. everybody out there, you are flawsome. And that has been so helpful to me because that means I'm not afraid to show my flaws, mm -hmm. which means I can be authentic and have truly intimate relationships with people. I can be vulnerable with people, which mm -hmm. to me means you know, sharing my flaws. And because I'm accepting of my flaws, I'm so much more accepting of your flaws. And I really cut people slack. Yeah. And it really, you know, helps create this community that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the things you're talking about, like women being vulnerable in front of each other, like if that is not a way to connect people, I don't know what is. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And um, that actually leads into one of the big blocks that I had in, in writing and self-publishing which was self-promotion. <laughs> <laughs> and um, there are, I, ha I made a video about this on my IGTV a few weeks ago about this concept of um, honoring our past selves. And what I mean by that is I've watched a few women move in a public and creative space and change and change what they did and expand their um, influence. And it's really amazing and without shame. So it's, so it's a, this shame free um, example of growth. And I read recently untamed by Glennon Doyle uh, Melton and in the book, she quotes one of her previous books and she says, yeah, I don't think that anymore. And I was like, can Wait, anybody you just change our minds? What? Yeah. Like, yeah, exactly. And I like, I would not have written this book mm -hmm. if I felt like I had to agree with every word in 10 years. Right. That's, that's great. You know, a, a really good friend of mine just recently recommended that um, Untamed by Glenna Doyle. And she said, Barb, she's basically you. So <clears throat> I do, I do need to, to check she's, her out. She's I wonderful. Wonderful. I heard an interview uh, with her, I think, on um, Brooke Castillo's podcast, The Life Coach School, which, by the way, I can't say enough good things about that woman. Um, can I move on to my next my next quote? OK. The point of grace and redemption isn't to make us good and right. The point of grace and redemption is to enable relationship. And I feel like I understand that so much more based on what we just said. Because if I'm so invested in being good and right, then I'm not going to be real with you. And how, what kind of a relationship can I possibly have? And I will say, like, I am, I'm 57 years old, and I am for the first time in my entire life in a healthy, loving, uh, vulnerable, and intimate romantic relationship with another person. And it is because I am able to be vulnerable, and I'm mm -hmm. able to share what's really going on with me. And I don't feel the need to people please. And I don't feel the need to hide. And it's, you know, I'm not feeling the need to be good and right. I mean, I, I try to be a good person. Right. And I try to do what is right. You try to be ethical. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, oh, and then you, you um, alluded to this before about empowering women, empower communities. So this is a phrase that is used in recovery all the time. Her people, her people. Hmm. That helps us to understand, like, you, you know, if somebody is doing something that is toxic, it's not because they're a horrendous person, it's because they're wounded. It doesn't mean that what they're doing is okay. Mm -hmm. But if 
thing that we don't usually hear is what you say next is the amazing thing is that healed people heal people and empowered people empower people and i think that that is so powerful and so true and um, for me, one of the greatest gifts of my recovery is not just that I got to heal, but I get to share my journey of healing with other people, which helps them to heal. So it magnifies my gift of healing. And as you say here, our world needs so much healing. And I think that's, that's magnified right now during this time of COVID-19 because all of these inequities in our society are being put into even more stark contrast as mm -hmm. a result of the systems in our society that are not equitable at all, mm -hmm. you know? So there's so much healing that's necessary. Um, you say, <clears throat> I hope you learn to take care of yourself and love yourself so very well. And there's something about the way that you said so very well that is so endearing to me. I felt like you were speaking to me. Like, um, in you know what? The, I, I mean, I cannot tell you how much I love that phrase. And then um, you say, love the messy, love the joyful, love the powerful, and especially love the morning. Learn yourself through these spaces and you will be unstoppable. And what I wrote underneath that was, I don't need anything from you when I love myself. It's true. You know, like if you're going around in the world trying to get love from other people mm -hmm. because you lack it in yourself, it's all like shallow and and um, unsatisfying. But when you love yourself and then you can come at the world from that space and not need the things from people, it's so much easier to connect. I, I mean, I wish I knew that, you know, many, many decades ago. And even if I didn't know that intellectually, I wouldn't have been able to do it. But. It's also very hard for us to show people what we actually need if we don't know. Right. So, so if we are not self-aware enough to have an understanding of what is actually a loving action and what actually makes us feel safe and whole, like even the best, like the best meaning people in our lives who maybe do really, really love us are not necessarily going to know how to speak to that in a fulfilling way if we are not self-aware right exactly and if we think we're not supposed to have needs you know we're yeah, there you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. um this may be in my opinion one of the most important lines in this book and you say the dangerous part of faith-based shame is how we attribute it to holiness do you want to say a little bit about that do you mind mm, i mean we only have 45 minutes left <laughs> Actually, we only have 18 minutes. <laughs> we only have 18 minutes left. Um, so really, that is also some, I, I unpack also in the book, this concept of purity culture, which is the Christian um, like term for rape culture, basically. Mm -hmm. um, like it's the same, it's, it's the same thing. We just have a different name for it. And we pretend that it's from God. Mm -hmm. So... <laughs> So uh, it's really it's really harmful, and it's um, this this concept really that that uh, our worth is based in physical attributes, and you know where 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 our worth as women is coming from, especially in these faith based cultures, um, really sends some mixed messages, and it's really, I, I feel like that's probably the most harmful thing about a lot of these, you know, big religious organizations is that if we're not aware of how like patriarchy and these, these really like challenging social things, issues that um, everyone deals with, Christians want to be like, oh, well, you know, we don't have that problem here. Well, mm, we do, and it makes it even worse when we're telling women not only we're not only enforcing rape culture, you know, from a social standpoint, we're also saying, oh, and this is how God wants you to be. Mm -hmm. And if you are assaulted, God thinks it's your fault. Like mm -hmm. that's a whole nother level of traumatic that a lot of women have to, you know, heal through. Right. Yeah, of course. Because like being raped isn't traumatic enough. Right. You know, then, then, you know, on the blame for that and believe that, you know, you actually caused this to happen or God wanted it to happen. And that you're unworthy of, you know, future love in your life because of it. I mean, 
Yeah, that's pretty horrendous. Okay, I just have one more um, sticky note here. Uh, <clears throat> we haven't really talked a lot about men here, and I do want to say that uh, my recovery program I've been talking about, there are just as many really damaged men as there are mm -hmm. women. They're just damaged mm -hmm. in different ways, and this is a good example. <clears throat> you say men are shamed for what they do and what they want. Women are shamed for who they are. And, you know, I think um, th that it's important to lift up, you know, that men have shame too. Oh, yeah. And it's profound and deep. And, um, but it's not for who they are. It's not no. for being man. It's maybe not being man enough. Mm -hmm. um, but for being woman, you know, we are often shamed, you know. So I don't know if you want to say anything. Um, yeah, that's, that's very true. And also, I so I talk about I really probably mainly only talk about like men specifically in that patriarchy chapter. Mm -hmm. And it's really to highlight the fact that patriarchy is terrible for all of us. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just a thing where, you know, women want to be treated better. And also women can can um, enact patriarchy just like we just like, you know, um, you know, you were talking earlier about how we grew up in this racist society and we assimilate you know, aspects of that, whether or not we intend to, like women can be just as patriarchal and just as harmful um, as men can be. Yeah. So it's just that the way the power dynamic shifts for the most part, a lot of times it's men enacting, um, enacting violence mm -hmm. just because of the way the power dynamic is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So patriarchy is just as harmful to men. And I think it's actually harder for a lot of them to speak out about it. Um, because of the narrative that society has, has handed them about what is manly. So right. I think that while there's a lot of terrible things about patriarchy for women, that it's very hard for men to break because of that specifically. Yeah, agreed. So um, one of the things I hear from men in my recovery program when I talk with them privately and personally is they say things like, I'm not like other men. And I'm like, you know what? None of you are like other None men. None of you are. <laughs> <laughs> and I have three friends in particular um, who are in the Mankind Project. I don't know if oh, you know. Yes. Um, but I cannot say enough good things about what I'm hearing from them saying about it, the types of experiences that they're having. And they're sort of redefining what does masculinity in the 21st century mean? Not sort of, that's what they're doing, is what they're redefining. Mean? And I think for what I've seen from the men that say, you know, I'm not like other men, is they feel the need to uphold this notion of masculinity and it's just not who they are. Mm -hmm. And they feel the need internally and they feel the need from the women around them and they feel the need from the culture and they judge themselves as profoundly lacking because they don't meet this stereotype of what it means to be a man. Mm -hmm. And um, so there is stuff going on out there. There are men um, and men who are watching, if you're interested in redefining masculinity in the 21st century, um, the Mankind Project. And there is another project that- I think I follow them. Is it the Good Men? There's a, is it the Good Men Project too? But it's, uh, it's One Village Healing. It's Eric okay. and he has a project specifically for men, which when you start talking about self-publishing, I'm going to- scoot over to Instagram and find the name of it so I can share mm -hmm. it with people. Um, but we have about 12 minutes left. So yeah. I kind of want to, so, like, if, if we're ready to move I'll try to scooch it. Um, about self-publishing, because so, you specifically said to me it was like a natural evolution of this book. So I'd like to, to right. hear. So the natural is for Dear Sister because Dear Sister is a community. Um, and one of the ways that I wanted to, like, I wanted the book to be an example of what I'm writing about. So I originally planned to traditionally publish and wait as long as necessary to traditionally publish because I was terrified of promoting myself. Um, and I thought that a publisher would mean that I wouldn't have to pay for my book and also that I wouldn't have to promote myself. And while I wouldn't have had to pay for my book, I also would have lost creative control and I would not have gotten the same financial reimbursement in royalties that I get um, as a self-publisher. So um, in traditional publishing, your royalties are usually about 10 to 20% of your profits. And um, in self-publishing, it's 60 to 80%. 
Wow. So yeah. So even if you're not selling a ton of books, like you put years into a book, um, it's nice to see some something back from that. Also, I have to say, while I have my book listed on Amazon and I have my book listed on Barnes and Noble and all of these other retailers, um, I actually see a much higher percentage if folks buy it from my website directly because they take a percentage of my profits to have the honor of, you know, being on their, on their platform. So when I started realizing I realized that self the um, traditional publishers also don't usually put a lot of resources into first time authors. Mm -hmm. So this was something that and and I also learned that they still want you to promote yourself and like build your readership. So when I learned that, I was like, OK, well, I'm going to be having to do this work anyways. I might as well get paid for it and also be able to have that creative control. Um, when I didn't really have a book yet fully, you know, I was like, oh, you know, it, you know, I didn't really have an understanding of like, well, you know, I really want to be able to choose my editor. I really want to, you know, I really want to be able to choose my creative team. And um, I, uh, I purposely found an editor who she was really amazing. I would not have like, we, there wouldn't be a book right now if it weren't for Monique. Um, and I wanted to empower another small business. Um, with who I chose for my editing. So I was able to do that. And we funded the cost for that through a Kickstarter campaign. So really the community came together to fund this book. And I think that that's super special and I love that. Fantastic. I wanted to come back to, um, I talked about there's um, One Village Healing has a men's group. Uh, it's run by Eric Ray, and it's called the Black Obsidian Men's Group, an intentional online affinity healing space for black men. And you can find them at onevillagehealing.org. Okay. Perfect. Thank Perfect. you. All right. Was there more that you wanted to say about self -help? Yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot. If people are you know, if you're in the place where you're looking at, you know, self-publishing versus traditional publishing, the only other thing that I, I would really caution people against is the, the uh, DIY route. Um, so be aware if you start looking at like Amazon Create Space that they also have an exclusivity clause, which mean you can, means you can only sell your book on Amazon um, for a certain amount of time after you self-publish. So you can't sell it on your website. You can't, you're not supposed to take it to like a, a show and sell it. You know, all of that is supposed to go through Amazon. And again, you're gonna get uh, less, less of a uh, return on that. Um, the other thing is, Keep in mind, if you when you self-publish a book, um, a lot of agents and traditional publishers do look at self-published work for um, people to potentially represent in the future for future projects. So if you put out a self-published work that is not of high quality, um, you're going to basically tank all of your options for the future. So that was one of those were also reasons why I was very picky with who I worked with in the self-publishing process to make sure that I was putting out a uh, quality piece of work so that while I like self-publishing, if in the future I ever want to um, move in a different direction, my options are open. Mm, that's great. Um, yeah. And in, in terms of the funding for the book, you said that you crowdsourced Mm -hmm. We used a Kickstarter campaign. You did. Okay, fantastic. Do you mind talking about like how long that was up, how long it took? Sure. So um, I did a lot of research, a okay. lot of research. Awesome. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, so the Kickstarter campaign I ran for a month and mm -hmm. I ran it and you can run them for two months, up to two months. Um, they don't recommend that you run them for longer than a month because people kind of lose interest. Mm -hmm. And also it's exhausting. Like, like yeah. this wasn't in like any of the stuff that people wrote about Kickstarter, but like running a campaign, if you're really like plugging it for a month, it's, it's exhausting. And I don't think that I would have lasted two months. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So that's good to know for just entrepreneurs in general, because yeah. Kickstarter is not just for authors. So that's no that's Kickstarter is for everything. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. Fantastic. The other thing um, that made made this a good fit for Kickstarter is that I had I had the manuscript done when I ran the Kickstarter. So I had the manuscript completely done. I had my editor chosen. I had a start date with her picked. And I um, I put all of that in the campaign information. I'm like, hey, 
Um, it's going to take me this long to edit and do what I need to do. And you can have books by Christmas. And it was a pre-order situation. Nice. So, yeah. So it wasn't a thing of like, oh, you know, pay me, pay my salary while I sit here and write. You know, I, I had a very specific plan in place for it. Awesome. And how did you come up with that plan? Um, so I started researching editors after I realized that, um, I probably wanted to self-publish and I found Monique, uh, Monique D. Mensa, and she has make your mark publishing solutions. Um, so she also does like self-publishing. She calls it a self-publishing assistant package, but she's like a book doula, you know, <laughs> <laughs> she births it into the world. She births the book into the world, man. Doula, it's not like an assistant. Funny. It's like a, like a coach, you know? <laughs> so she has a network of, um, cover designers and interior designers and um, all of these people that she works with. Mm -hmm. So she was able to, um, she was able to really manage all of that. And it was very, very like specific of how long I, like if I had to do something in the editing process, if I was like reviewing her edits, I had a week to do that. And I had a due date of when I was going to send the manuscript back to her. And it was very organized, which I like. I'm, yeah, me too. I'm type A, so <laughs> so I like that. Um, there was something else I wanted to say about self-publishing. Oh, the other thing to be aware of if you do look into self-publishing is to be aware of vanity presses. So vanity presses are like um like kind of like book baby. They're um companies that say they're they help you self-publish, but in reality, um if your name is not the publisher, if their name is the publisher, or if the ISBN is in their name, technically they own the publishing rights to your book. So um, it's important to make sure whoever you work with, whatever direction you go with self-publishing, that you own your ISBN and you own your publishing rights, mm -hmm. um, actually. And it's not, you know, you're not paying somebody to help you produce your book and then also they own your publishing rights. Yeah. Okay, good to know. How did you find Monique? I found her on Instagram. Okay. So Yeah, and I did a coaching I did a coaching uh, call with her in like January of 2019 and then I um ordered some of the other books that she had worked on to, you know, do my due diligence, make sure that that was the direction I wanted to go. Mm -hmm. Um she did a sample edit for me and then I started planning I started planning the Kickstarter and I ran the Kickstarter in August. So I planned and prepped for the Kickstarter for like seven months. <laughs> oh, okay. Good to know. <laughs> Fantastic information. So, and what was it about Monique that had made you choose her over someone else? Um, she had a lot of experience. Um, she was a small business, so she was running her own show, which I was something I wanted to support women in business. Um, I liked that she seemed very upfront about things. I'm not like, you know, I wanted to make sure that I had, you know, that I was working with someone that knew what they were doing and also would give me like actual mm -hmm. feedback. I, you know, I'm not just looking for a pat on the head and like, oh yeah, your book is great, you know? Um, I was looking for constructive feedback and I really liked that she had the option of like the self-publishing inclusive package. So most of the other editors that I looked at didn't necessarily do that. And also there are different kinds of editors. So there's like line editors, there's developmental editors, there's, um, copy editor, you know, like, so she would kind of package all of that together and do what needed to be done in one fee because it can get very costly if you start, if you hire a developmental editor and then you hire a line editor and then, you know, then the cost really um, multiplies. Wonderful. Well, uh, I am so appreciative of this conversation. I can't wait to finish writing, uh, writing, <laughs> Freudian slip finish um, reading your book and I'm sure we'll have more conversations. And when we get to the point where known is back to being open to the community for events, um, I hope that we'll have you back there again. Yes. And so along, with your, along with your community. Um, I want to thank everybody who joined us. I want to also remind you that even if you're watching the recording of this, you can go ahead and leave comments and we'll make sure that Megan gets them. Her, uh, social media information and her website are listed below. 
And um, if you're interested in being on Known Live or on Pivot Talk or Digital Media Sync, which is our which are our three online programs, you can send me an email at barb at knowncoworking.com. And just uh, one last pitch for next Tuesday, Digital Media Sync is going to be addressing Google Analytics for people who have e-commerce. And then next Thursday, our next Pivot Talk is with Della Liepman, who created Nestle, which is a lactation space. And she's going to be talking about how she's pivoting to accommodate all of the health concerns for the post-COVID environment. So again, thank you so much to Megan Wooding, New Haven County author of Dear Sister, who also self-published. And I thank you so much, Megan. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're so welcome. Bye now. Bye-bye.